Welcome, affiliated listeners. We are super excited to have you all here today from where you might be coming from, whether it's at home, on walk, whatever it's going on. We're just happy to have you, particularly with, I think, was one of the, I'll tell you, in the last six months, like, of the conversations, talks that I listened to, this probably had me sit back and go, holy, and I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to, holy... That is so simple, but something I've never thought about before and really, really excited to share today, particularly what that was, is how right now with what we're going to be talking about with our great guest is how you can almost double your business without doing anything except what we're going to talk about today. So I don't know if there's any other lower lifts to increasing your bottom line than what we're going to talk about today, but super, super exciting. And we have um, Chad Durfee here today. Chad, how are you doing? Doing excellent. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Yeah. And for those of you that aren't actually watching um, the podcast, I'm going to actually tell you first, pause, stop, go to YouTube, watch on YouTube, because you just need to see Chad's back, backdrop here. His whole setup <laughs> is too legit to just listen to. You got to see it's fantastic. But Chad is telling people, we are going to be talking today about what you really do and how the services you provide and really the value you provide to companies and individuals, which is going to come down to almost that, that thing that you I heard from you say, which is how to double your business specifically with referrals, which I know is a word that a lot of us hear. You obviously know a ton about it, um, but a lot of people hear about referrals. And when we think about referrals, I think commonly I know when I think about referrals, I think like a life insurance agent or you know a barber or something like that, something in the service industry. I'm like, yeah, I guess they get referrals. But I didn't necessarily think about what it means to our business until you started talking. I was like, holy cow, this is massively important for people to hear about. So before we jump into that piece, though, I'd love to get a little back history about how you kind of got into the business, where you kind of found this mastery around referrals, um, and kind of what brought you to being here today. Yep, let me get to that real quick. But first, I want to set context before anybody jumps off because they heard the word referrals and they think like, "Ooh, I know what that is. I'm good. Right. We're not talking about referrals like your mom and dad or grandma and grandpa talked about them. Like this isn't the old world referrals. This is I mean, they're boring. They're ineffective. They don't scale. This is totally new. So we're going to jump into that in a second. But for those of you that think you know what we're going to talk about, I advise you to stay on, on board. So my name is Chad Durfee. I own Referral Wave. Uh, you know, I've been in the high ticket sales industry for 20 plus years, everything from car sales, which is where I cut my teeth, uh, to real estate, to, you know, high end banking, to mortgages and brokering. Um, and now in the coaching consulting agency space. Um, so I've, I've been in most areas with it and seen the old way of referrals. Uh, my, my educational background is in behavioral and social psychology. And so everything that I've ever done in my sales experience has been based in that. Right. And so, um, you know, every industry that I've been in, I've built very quickly and been one of the top in that industry. And it's always been through referral systems and using the same pillars, uh, that I now teach, um, that are actually based in peer reviewed uh, human psychology, right? So, but that's kind of my background, fell into the coaching consulting agency space by accident. I actually used to teach this to high end mortgage companies, to uh, Fortune 500 companies. And yeah, my sure. wife, who yeah, was an online high ticket fitness well, coach, so asked yeah, me to help her build out her system uh, maybe three years ago. And so I helped her build her system and she quadrupled her business with it in like four months. And I was like, oh, oh. wow. And then and so she referred me to her business coach who was like, how are you doing this? And we did a similar <laughs> thing to him. He referred me out. And then, you know, from there, we started hitting, you know, your bigger names like your Alaric Hex and yeah. Professor Finos and, you know, Rudy Moores, et cetera, um, and started to kind of trickle back down. So it's been a, it's, it's been quite a fun road. Dude, that's awesome. It's, I mean, what an interesting way to be like, I'm going to help my wife, wife out with this. This seems like it'd be good. And it's like explodes into a whole business. So I'm going to take a weird derailment. And this is just just because we have a podcast thing. I'm just super curious about this, so especially since I love that you cut your teeth in car sales. Like I want I think more people should try and cut their teeth in car sales. I think it's, it's definitely you can learn a lot about how to actually sell on a relational way. Right. I think a lot of people think it's like pitching features. I'm like, no, no, no. It's understanding people and making fits. So, um, but this is totally random. I'm just super curious what your thoughts are. Cause I don't know if you saw, I think it was a couple months ago or like within the last 60 days, the Ford CEO came out and said he wants to get rid of, um, you know, dealerships, the dealership model is dead. Um, and just wants to eliminate it. So as somebody that got their teeth cut in that, I find it really interesting, especially since nothing's worse to me than a bad car salesman. Um, not even if they're pitchy, they're just not doing anything. Um, so I was, I've been very frustrated with the car buying experience. So I was kind of 
interested in that, but I also like, oh, it sucks that we've cut away a great sales kind of training place. Um, so I, I don't know if you heard that, but I was just curious what your thoughts would be. Yeah, it, it's a good question. I did hear that. And um, it's a it's a double edged sword, right? Like they're they're looking to cut costs and get rid of all the commissions and salespeople that they don't think are necessary. Um, and for a lot of people, it's not right. It's become a transactional experience. Um, but in my opinion, there is still a huge percentage of the population that that wants and actually needs somebody's uh, support and advice that is actually an expert in different models and features and other things to like kind of take them through that process. But, you know, uh, car sales is such a such a harsh sales environment that you get really great salespeople and you get really shady salespeople. And that's what's created that that dynamic in that industry. That's kind of like the, you know, the shady car salesman, unfortunately, and dealerships rather than um, fix that and get rid of the bad blood have have just gone straight opposite direction, which I don't know that I necessarily agree with, but we'll see how it turns out. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. So, well, too bad. Well, hopefully for those that are having future generations, maybe they don't get rid of the dealerships out. They'll never get rid of used car salesmen. I think that'll always exist. But I do think, again, if you do it right, um, it could be an amazing experience for both sides. Because, yes, I need someone, even if it's just to show me how to work the damn dials and new setups and one day develop a minivan that has a partition that could go up and silence my kids, that would be awesome. I think if they could just create that. Um, sold right away, forever shows me that one. So, um, well, cool. Well, let's let's kind of go in that next step then. So um, as we circle back, I know it's total derailment, but just popped in there. I thought I was curious. So, um, but as we kind of go back to what we were originally talking about and what we're here for uh, is when you're, so you had this business, you're working with other coaches and people with referral programs. So what, what I actually want to, the biggest question is like, why? Why do so many people, miss out with what referrals could do their business. And I even think maybe we should spend some time to redefine what referrals are. Cause I think we have that conception, like you talked about, like, you know, your mom and dad's referrals and here's a business card or, or something like that. The awkward, like clunky, could you tell me somebody that we could talk to? Let's kind of define what referrals most people think about and what you think about when you say them. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, you know, this, we work with the coaching industry, but we work with everybody from the medical space all the way over to service providers. Anybody that has high ticket clients, we really specialize in that high ticket referral because the psychology changes at that point if the product or service is more than $1,000. Um, and, and as far as referrals in general, the, the way that we look at it, it's besides paid advertising, referrals are the next most lucrative lead channel on the planet. People talk. There are a billion uh, brands mentioned every day between, sure. you know, social spheres. And the problem is, you know, you have this idea of word of mouth, right? Word of mouth can be really good or bad, et cetera. But word of mouth is just word of mouth, right? Without an actual introduction, it doesn't always end in a sale, right? So, um, what we're looking for is that word of mouth to convert to an introduction. And it, there's a process to making that happen and helping your clients be aware of it without feeling sleazy or pressury or, you know, providing kind of those awkward, like, oh, who do you know? Right. Um, they they kind of like the way people used to do it. But at, at the most foundational level, referrals are a lead channel, just like your YouTube channel can be a lead channel. Your Facebook ads are a lead channel. If you want to do a billboard, right, it's, a, it's a potentially a lead channel. That's what referrals are. It just happens to be next to paid advertising, the next biggest and most lucrative lead channel on the planet. And the only one that a business can really outright own, right? Cause nobody can change its algorithm and make your ads more expensive or drop the reach or change, change something right. Or, or, um, targeting like there's so many different things that can change on social media. If I decide to take a week off and I don't post for a week, I'm not losing business. Right. So I fully own that lead channel. It's mine to do with what I want. So it, it creates, it's like a hedge in businesses, right. Um, that provides uh, an enormous amount of stability and security. And at the higher levels, uh, can really fight against the, the natural compression that starts to happen as you grow from 2000 to 10,000 to 20,000 a month to 200,000 a month you know, your margins start to compress and your referral and re renewal revenue is what fights against that. 
Nice. Cause I mean, cause you really, because the acquisition cost is so easy to control, um, you know, you really could keep it very high margin at all times, as long as you're developing it intelligently. So, but like you said, it, I mean, it is from human, human behavior standpoint, it's probably the oldest lead channel to exist, right? Is some basis it, of it referrals. Is the oldest and the one that's going to be around for the longest. Yeah. Yeah. Unless we stop talking to each other and caring what other people think, I'm pretty sure referrals are going to be around forever. So, um, but you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, this actually dovetails really nicely because last week we spoke with um, Brad Hart and he talked about how building your own mastermind and creating a mastermind and how high ticket is one of the biggest things missing from tons of businesses out there um, is having some high ticket component. Um, and he's like, it's actually really easy, but I think this is one of the areas where people get nervous is asking for referrals, getting referrals, how to build referrals, right? What does that even look like? Um, and, and they start to falter. So I think one area that's sometimes really nice, we could see that this makes sense. It's just a new acquisition channel or lead channel that we should have in our business. We probably already do have, but we might not be doing anything with. So I think uh, as we get into what are some of the mistakes that early on kind of keep people from either creating a good program or even starting a referral program that's going to be subsidized of their business that you oftentimes see. Yeah, sure. So um, let me talk about a couple of misconceptions that are keeping people poor and, and I'll say referral poor. And when I say poor, I'm talking about passing over opportunities repeatedly, right? P O O R. Um, so Good first acronym, and foremost, <laughs> right? You got to have those acronyms. So first and foremost, the, the misconception or misbelief that referrals are inconsistent and unpredictable, right? Most business owners that are, especially as you get to the higher levels, they're looking for consistency and predictability, and that's what they focus on, right? In, in their business, KPIs, et cetera. And referrals are kind of looked at as like, oh, it's organic, it's word of mouth, it's gonna happen if we do a good job customer service wise. Uh, but referrals come in waves, right? That's, that's the name of the company, referral wave. But oftentimes those waves are looked at as inconsistent and unpredictable. And what happens when something in the business is inconsistent or unpredictable, you don't focus on it like you would something else. And that lack of focus then perpetuates the issue, it becomes even more inconsistent and unpredictable and et cetera. It's this downward spiral. So that's one of the first things. Um, one of the second well, things. Well, let's pause and is, talk about that. Sure. Actually, I want to talk about that one a little bit more, and then we'll go to that second one. Because I, I think what you hit a big thing on there is it, it does seem inconsistent. And I think a lot of it, sometimes this is where I used to, actually as an accounting manager, I used to hate marketers because this idea of brand marketing, it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, it just happens. Um, and so somebody wants to tell you, I did that, but they have no metric or process to actually say, Yes, this is what it is. So I could see why oftentimes people in here might be saying, like, yeah, why would I focus on that? Because it feels so hard to touch, so hard to feel, even though I know it's really great when it's there. How am I going to repeat it time and time again? So I think that's where, like you said, inconsistent, don't focus. A lot of it's because, like, I can't predict it. I can't put my finger on it of why it's happening, where it's coming from. Um, how to replicate it over and over again. So, I mean, yeah, it's just just a great point. I just wanted to pause on that and really affirm because I think that's a, a common thing that a lot of people really run into and just turn referrals into a non-starter because of. But for sure. And, and what you have to do with referrals, is not one of those things so much where, with brand where you, you, it's totally vague and untouchable. You just have to widen the gap with which you're looking at the results. So rather than looking day to day or week to week, like you would be looking with your CPAs, with your ad costs, et cetera, it's going to be, I'm looking in six month increments, right? What do we do the last six months versus the coming six months versus that six months? Now, it doesn't mean that you still don't have KPIs. Like when we work with our clients, we still have KPIs. The KPIs are just more action items than results, right? So there's a certain amount of, you know, forms that need to be filled out. So if, if nine out of every 10 of your clients do this thing, that's the KPI we're looking for. And if, you know, 70% of your clients do this next step, that's the KPI we're looking for. And as long as these action items are being hit along the way, we know that the result is going to continue to perpetuate in the future. So the problem is most people don't know what those action items are. And so there's nowhere to start other than to like, be like, Hey, who do you know? Kind of like halfway through or at the end. And it just creates those icky feelings because nobody knows what they're doing. So rather than feel that they just avoid it altogether. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes asking like referrals like that, I don't know for any office fans out there. I don't know if you're an office fan, but there's a scene where Pam is trying to get money for their wedding. So she just starts asking people around the office for money. And I remember Kevin comes up and like, she's like, well, you could just give us a check. He's like, you want me to give you 
money like and he's super uncomfortable i was like i think that's how people feel about referrals oftentimes because of just what you described they don't really know what anything means so they feel like they're asking somebody for like the naming rights to their firstborn something that's so much more than it really is and it creates a lot of anxiety around that so um well let's we'll circle back to those metrics and those kind of checkpoints do you think that's a a really powerful thing and we want to get to that but first let's do the second kind of misconception you commonly see um, when it comes to referrals yeah so well and, and just to kind of put the the nail in the wood a little bit there i don't okay. even think that's a term but i just made it up <laughs> yeah um, nail coffin that, wood that, whatever <laughs> i don't want to call it a coffin because it didn't really seem like relevant but <laughs> um also those awkward feelings like you know or like you're saying like asking for my firstborn child or whatever most of that comes from not having a warm up process, right? Like it's almost like ambushing clients with a referral request at some point without actually having a process in place that, that normalizes referrals for the, from the client's perspective and actually makes it feel organic and easy for them. So that by the time you even ask, if you ever even have to, they're already expecting it and have people in mind, right? So that warm up process that we'll talk about in a little bit is one of the key pieces to, to making referrals feel really good, not just for yourself, but for your clients, right? Because over 90% of referral opportunities are missed in the first two weeks of signing a new client um, because they're missing the warm up, right? What I call priming. And so we could talk about that in a little bit, but, um, you know, happy to jump into another big misconception if you want. Yeah, let's go to the misconception. There. We'll come back to that because, yeah, I'm super excited to kind of talk about what we'll define as that honeymoon period and why it's so valuable to be having that conversation. So that'll be good to circle back on. Yeah. So first one, obviously the inconsistency and unpredictability of referrals is what keeps most people from focusing on referrals, right? They don't see it as a priority because they don't understand what they're actually missing out on. We actually have a calculator that we show them. We can look at their active clients, how many they currently have, how many they're bringing on on average a month and their LTV. And we can tell them very accurately how much additional revenue is available for them through this lead acquisition channel of referrals if they had the system in place. So that's something for another time. Misconception number two is uh, this. If my clients are happy and satisfied and getting results, they're going to naturally refer me more often. And there is zero statistical correlation between happy, satisfied clients and referring clients, right? So the people that are getting referrals and a lot of people are like, oh, I'm good. I already get referrals don't understand that the referrals they're getting, they could double, triple, 10X down on and get even more if they had a system in place to bridge the gap between happy, satisfied and referring. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, they did a, they did a study in 2017 called the anatomy of the referral. Uh, anatomy of the referral. They did that is the biggest study on referrals ever. And they did it in the financial sector, right? With wealth advisors, financial advisors. And they followed five different companies over two years and basically just looked at every single aspect of referrals, right? This was important for me because everything I, I do is peer reviewed. It's, it's research backed. It has to be. Um, cause that's the only thing that doesn't change is our, you know, our actual psychology as human beings that hasn't changed for thousands of years. Yeah, uh, you keep the, hoping it very, does sometimes, but here you we keep, are. <laughs> I mean, there's little pieces, right? There's little yeah. pieces that will shift here and there, but like at a fundamental level, our flight fighter or, or, or flight, I guess you could say fight, fright, flight turns into like, you know, procrastinate, resist, and, uh, you know, um, you explain why I didn't do it right to uh, justify it would be. So we just have different terms for those, those things, but the psychology isn't changing. So the study, the anatomy of the referral, what they, what they did is they categorized clients into four different types. They had um, satisfied, content, uh, dissatisfied and disgruntled. And I'm sorry, it was engaged, satisfied, content, disgruntled. So engaged, satisfied, content, disgruntled. And what they found was the disgruntled category. So the engaged category referred the most, like 99% of those people referred. The disgruntled category referred more than satisfied and content combined. What? Yeah. Wow. Right. And so that, on the outset, you're like, okay, that doesn't make any sense. That's not logical. Um, here's, here's where it gets logical. What they found was the clients who identified as disgruntled typically complained. They gave a bad review. They reached out. Something was going on. They wanted to be heard. 
and the company would then give extra attention and say, wow, I'm really sorry this happened, or this wasn't supposed to go this way. How can we make it right? And they went above and beyond to make it right, which then engaged the client, made them feel heard and understood and, and taken care of. And then they would, you know, they became raving fans, right? They would then refer. The satisfied and content categories, it was a transaction for them. There was no relationship. There was no engagement. You were simply a transaction. And I think what happens in, in most businesses is we just assume that our clients who are happy and satisfied, who got the result that we promised them they would get, that was an expectation they came in with, right? So that the whole idea of like over deliver, right? Surprise and delight. There's real merit to that because, you know, in the marketing space to get a client is difficult. You kind of have to promise the world. You like, you have to have an irresistible offer. It has to be amazing, right? And then what happens is we bring these clients in under this amazing irresistible offer and never reset expectations once they're in the doors. And so if they don't get this amazing irresistible result, they're dissatisfied or they're just content. And even if they do get this amazing irresistible result, they're satisfied. They're not really engaged, right? You didn't give yourself any space to over deliver. Um, so, so what's in the gap? Like what takes them from, have, like happy and satisfied, right? Content and satisfied to engaged. What, like what bridges that gap to get them from that point to referring clients? Yeah, that's super interesting. I, I kind of, it's, it's one, it, it's funny. This makes me think about my griping around what I think is the, 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 the horrors of the added like tip line on credit card receipts now. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm tipping for everything. But, but you know, if you deliver, even if it's like, an amazing experience, but you said it was going to be an experience. You just gave me what I wanted. It's this general sense of like, you gave me what I paid for, right? Like why would, what is great except for, like you said, that transaction was completed. Um, Cause even like the disgruntled, you solve the problem, which honestly, especially given this time, I don't think most consumers assume their problems will be solved by companies. If you have it right. They think they're just your company sucks. And I'm going to say it's going to suck and I'm going to have to drive a solution. So when you solve it and you go, like you said, above and beyond, it's like, oh, this is great. You have that opportunity. But yeah, I mean, gosh, if it's just transactional, why do I care? Like what, what is even going to, the most that you would do is if somebody asked you the question um, and like, like specifically as I'm looking for X, Y, Z, you might say, well, I went through these people and they did X, Y, Z. I guess you could do the same thing, right? A very weak referral that you would probably never actually connect them with in any way, shape or form. Well, and this is where tactics are so important, right? So um, to bridge that gap, because the marketing, the marketing space is kind of like cannibalized a little bit. And what I mean by that is we've gotten to a space where we have to p position ourselves as so incredibly valuable, like the absolute only solution for somebody to even get them to buy with us because the buyer's resistance is so high because so many companies have done exactly the same thing and not delivered or under delivered or delivered, but not over delivered. And so you never got that engaged client, right? Like this is where you get those few standouts like that Zappos, you know, those types of brands, right? Where you, you come in and you get to kind of know the story of that with Tony Shea and, you know, how, how they created an experience that until the client was in the door and they were experiencing some level of problems, it gave the company space to then over deliver and engage all this reciprocity because it was above and beyond what was expected. Um, there was even a story from like Delta or maybe it was American airlines that would like purposely have like a really kind of like shitty customer experience initially so that clients would complain. And then they had a process for when they would complain, they could really over deliver and engage that reciprocity and then create lifelong clients, right? So there's a lot of psychology behind this. Now I'm not saying to do that because you can't compete if you do that. But what I'm saying is you need to be able to have the irresistible offer. And then once they're in the door on that irresistible offer, have a process for resetting expectations, which then gives yourself some space to again, over deliver. So you got to understand your customer journey. You know, as we focus so much on the front end, the client, the, the prospect journey, and then once they're in the door, forget about that customer journey. But if you can double, triple or quadruple the value of your clients on the back end, that's two, three, four less clients on the front end that you have to bring in to be worth the same amount. Oh, no, I, especially with the, the way the paid media markets have been, you know, we're seeing huge shifts. CPMs continue to go up across the board. 
Um, you know, people are struggling more and more and more. It's getting so expensive to acquire one customer. Why would why not really get efficient acquisition that you can through the back end of referrals? So one thing I want I, I just want to talk a little bit more about that you mentioned here that I think is really um, interesting was the it's the redefining customer expectations. So, um, which just quick joke, I, I think, uh, Fran it was air France. They need to remember that you actually have to over deliver on the solution of the problems you create. So maybe sometimes you might lose sight of that being an important part of creating problems on first experiences. Um, but yeah, so talk about that kind of just, if you could maybe expand or provide example of what redefining expectations after acquisition looks like, um, for referrals or just kind of in general. Yeah, for example, well, let me first of all go back to the the marketing one, right, where we're talking about, um, I just want to give you a, a, a good client example, when we're talking about those raising, like rising costs of CPAs and, and like out competing each other. So one of our clients and a good friend of mine, Rudy Moore, um, they actually lose $250 on the front end for every single client they bring in the door. But because their Ascension model is so good on the back end and their referrals and upsells and renewals, and it's good because they reset expectations to start and then they've got some tactics for hitting those those metrics, they actually, you know, every client that comes in the door on the front end, $250 loss. Actual overall lifetime value of the clients, over $1,000, right? So where most companies would see, I'm losing $250 per client, I got to turn off these ads. These aren't working. This stuff is not working. They're actually seeing that as like, because they have that Ascension model, they can outcompete anybody and everybody else for ads. They can outspend, they can outcompete, and they can outlose because their backing is so much better than their competitors because of the referrals, renewals, and upsells. So that's one example right there, just so your clients can kind of see an example of, or, or your listeners can kind of see an example of what this actually looks like and why that LTV increase through those three methods is so incredibly important as you continue to scale and out compete um, in the industry and in the space that's currently self cannibalizing. Well, especially since if you have good referrals, it's almost like one acquisition doesn't mean one customer, right? So that that 250 isn't me buying one customer, I'm buying potentially three, four five, whatever that might be, if you have a great pro program at the back end. Well, exactly. I mean, let's just say for round numbers, I charge $10,000 for a coaching program, and I get one client in the door. Great, ten thousand dollars. Now, if my upsell rate, um, or let's say a resign rate, is fifty uh, percent, which it, we can easily get there with most companies, and that next program that they're ascending into is twenty five k, now all of a sudden my LTV just went up to like seventeen k or seventeen and a half k, and then if that client refers me another person who enrolls, now all of a sudden I just shot up to like twenty five k for my LTV. And right. And then if I've got other things like other little things that they can cross sell, upsell, et cetera, now I'm at 30 K. And, and so, you know, you can see how quickly, you know, that one, when I look at a client coming in the door, I'm not looking at 10 K like every client that comes in the door for me is, is easily worth over 25 K. Right. So I'm not looking at this front end, I'm looking at this back end and then I can make all my marketing, uh, I guess expense expenses, like the, the amount that I'm willing to spend to acquire a new client now all of a sudden goes way up, right? Because I know what that's actually going to look like on the back end. So the way that I look at spending money to acquire clients is a lot different than a lot of other businesses will look to acquire clients and how they, they're willing to spend money. Yeah. Cause you have that high margin profitability baked in, in the back end. you know, what's going to happen when they come in. Um, and, and just, yeah, I mean, that's huge, right? We, we talk on this podcast all the time about, you know, LTV, really knowing your LTV and high LTV, it just really empowers front end acquisition. And so many people just focus on the front end and they're like, I got it. You know, it's like a dog finally catching its own tail and they don't know what to do once it's there. Um, but it's like, no, no, no. You, if you don't have the back end, if you haven't figured out that back end, it's really, really challenging to acquire and be competitive through acquisition without just really over promising, which continues to create a problem, right? So now I'm making these claims I know I'm not going to fit in on. And I'm stuck in, you know, the leaky bucket life, life cycle, where I just have to constantly acquire, I have to constantly be more aggressive, um, especially if you want to have a brand for your company. Boy, is that going to be challenging because you're the brand of broken promises at that point, because you just have to escalate to meet your acquisition standards since your back end isn't good enough. Both, you know, potentially are I would say short life cycles of brands if you're in, if you're in those spots, unless you're Comcast, and then you could just be terrible forever because 
people can't seem to get rid of you. Um, even right. if they try. Or you're the D- <laughs> you're the DMV. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. owned by the government, yeah. right? But for the rest of us, uh, you know, it's it's a big problem. So, well, well, that's I mean, huge, really, really telling stats. And so, I think uh, one of the things, kind of transitioning that. Now we know that this is a huge opportunity. We know that lots of people probably have misconceptions, which is why they haven't focused on this. And so, I think the next step would be, okay, what now? What's kind of the you know, obviously outside, just hey you know, talk to Chad, he'll fix it all for you. But like right now today, if someone was looking and evaluating ways that they could improve, just quickly improve a referral program or even have one to, you know, to begin with, what are the first steps they should start taking? Yeah. So first step is how can you engage reciprocity as quickly as possible, bringing a client in the door, that onboarding experience that people go through that's the real first impression that they have with you as a new client. They have a first impression with you uh, as a brand, as a company, as a service or product provider. But once they're in the door and they've actually swiped the credit card, that's what we call an ether spike point. That's a point uh, in your customer journey now where there's naturally more emotion than at other times. And we know that emotion creates memory. The higher the emotion, the deeper the memory. And if it's positive emotion, then that's a great memory. And if it's negative emotion, that's not a great memory, right? So how do we engage reciprocity when the clients come in the door? There's some really simple ways to do that, right? Have a very defined, um, supportive onboarding experience Um, that that could include a welcome gift. We love to do that with our clients. We love to, you know, as soon as a client swipes their credit card, we have a, a gift survey that gets automated out to them that says, hey, congratulations and welcome. Please take a minute to customize your gifts. And immediately they just paid whatever amount they paid and they're like, oh, I get gifts. That's really cool. So they're taking a second to customize the gifts. Now inside that survey, we also have some strategic soft referral questions that um, are very like low level compliance that also get them excited, right? Like the first question on the, on the survey is, hey, let's take a moment to customize your welcome gift, program gifts and future referral rewards. Right. And then they start, you know, going through and, and answer some questions on the survey. But we're engaged in reciprocity, which is is social currency. Right. So now that reciprocity is engaged, resistance is down a little bit, which is good. And, and real fast, I just want to define something because you know what you're talking about. For those of you who don't know, when when Chad's mentioning reciprocity, that's the idea that I give somebody something and we're, we're already at a deficit to feel that, you know, that person now feels the need to reciprocate or give something back. So when you have a state of a gift, even though they purchased something from you, but now you're giving an over delivery of here's something free, um, or if maybe we're booking a call before they even swipe the card, whatever it might be, but here's the free whatever, um, you know, that's that's putting them at, like you said, a social equity deficit that they they naturally feel inclined to, to true up, um, which is key when you're going to be asking for a referral because it's almost like here's the path to make up for the t-shirt that I just gave you or that might be. Exactly. Exactly. And t-shirts uh, I would stay away from, but here's a, here's a good example of how this works. So um, we have a podcast client who as part of their sales call, they would let the client know like, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. Here's the outcomes. Here's what's included. We're going to give you a podcast mic. We're going to give you the setup. We're going to do all these things. And then once the client signed, they would then mail them the podcast mic that would show up at their door with a nice little note. They would do all these other things. And what we did when we went in there to engage reciprocity and over deliver, right? This is one of those things before we, you want to engage reciprocity before you reset expectations, because that, that feeling of reciprocity or like dropping that resistance now allows you the space to reset expectations a little bit and have them be more patient, and open and, and, and cool with it. Versus like, oh, bait and switch, you know, you don't want to have that feeling at all. So what we did was we just said, hey, don't tell them they're going to get a podcast mic. Like, just take that out of your sales offer. Like, nobody's going to buy or not buy your program because you're giving them a $200 mic. That's not like, it's a 10K program. Nobody's going to say yes or no because of that one little mic. So let's take that out. And then what we did is we had it show up unexpectedly within the week of them purchasing as like a, Hey, we're so excited to have you on board. So excited. In fact, that we wanted to get you one of the best mics in the industry and, and start you off with a bang. And this is just a nice little gift from us to say, you know, we love you and we're here with you right now. All of a sudden the client's like, Oh wow, that's super cool that they did that. I was not expecting that. And they got a new podcast mic, right? And it didn't cost the company more money. We literally, all we did is we changed the placement of where that got sent out from like a couple days difference. And then we just changed the language and how we got it out there, which then made the client feel like, Oh, this is really cool. I feel really taken care of. So by the time they got to the onboarding call with them, 
they were able to then, you know, say, hey, listen, I know that we talked about X, Y, Z when you came in on the sales call that is totally available for you. But I want to you know, set context and really set expectations so that as we move through this process, you know, you know, kind of what's coming up. Right. So 20 percent of our clients will have these amazing results. Right. And 60 percent will be here. But eventually they'll get here. Right. Just got to be patient and trust the process. And then maybe 5% won't get it. And that's where our guarantee comes in. Right. So it allows them to reset the X. So the ad was like, you know, look at all of our clients that are getting these crazy results. Come in the door. Here's the gift. Engage reciprocity. Let's reset expectation. Hey, like 20% of our clients get this right off the bat, but don't expect it right off the bat. It might take some time. It might take a buildup. So be patient with us and follow through and trust the process. So they're able to reset that expectation now so that when the client comes in, the last thing on their mind is that this ad that they saw that's like, this is the result I'm going to get and this is what I paid for. So I expect this. It's now, oh, I want that, but I understand that this might take some time. And if it doesn't happen right away, I can keep working at it and you're going to be with me. And so if it doesn't happen right away, there's not now a client that's like, you know, dissatisfied. God, that is super good. That's I think where you get those content people like, hey, they gave it to me, but it didn't really do everything I thought it would, right? Or, hey, I bought it, I spent this. And, and I think because some people might even not complain in that scenario, right? They might just think, oh, another bad agency, another bad course, right? Just chalk it up the next time. Maybe I just won't buy one of those again. Like they won't refund or anything else um, because they felt not that they were duped, but it was their fault for being, you know, buying something stupid or buying something that didn't meet their standards. That's super, I'm just, I'm really like listening to this and now going like, what? Oh, sorry. <laughs> right. I was just going to say, now sales resistance just got went up a little bit. So on the next sales call they have with the next service provider, they're like, hey, I never make a decision on the spot. I need to take some time because I've been burned in the past. Right. It, because somebody else created that for them. Because so the industry as a whole, if the industry as a whole just understood this back end process and how to, you know, really love on their clients in that first two weeks and over deliver and just took a little bit of time to do that. Not only are they going to, with some tactics that we would put in place, get more referrals and renewals and upsells and just be more profitable in general, but it also is going to help the industry as a whole, right? And because the marketing space is great and marketers are amazing at making things feel irresistible and people are just like, I want results now, 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 because that's what's being marketed. So that's what they want. And so if the industry had a, a better handle on resetting expectations as a whole, we'd all be doing each other a big favor when it comes to, you know, continuing to grow. Yeah. But boy, I mean, what it, it's the other thing too, is like, it just provides you so much equity in your relationship with your clients and customers, right? When you could reset those expectations. I, I just like, I'm thinking like that could be, even if you're not using referrals, if you're onboarding a supplement, right? You just said it's going to do all these crazy things. And then if you then engage afterwards, like, Hey, it does do these crazy things for these people. But just so you know, like, here's this band of people that are going to take more time. And you might be somebody that not only does it not work, you have some weird, you know, weird effects, or it's going to make your skin break out in hives, which is totally normal can happen. Now here's the customer support. If that does happen to guarantee if you're in this band, here's the resource center that you could go to be patient. Here's other things. And if you're in this band, please reach out to us and give us a testimonial. Cause we'd love to hear about it. Um, cause obviously it's great that that, that had that change. Like that is just such a brilliant thing that I could tell you, I never hear and I'm not doing even my own business. So I was like, Holy crap, that is just stupid. Makes sense for everybody. And yeah, I mean, if, you, if no one does anything else today, but just does that, in their businesses, boy, that's not only going to be impactful, but impactful, like you said, for the entire industry. That's awesome. So, geez, I didn't know where we were going after that. I got so distracted by that one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Uh, but yeah, actually, there. so we reframe, we reset. So now we've reset these expectations. We also, as a part of that resetting the expectations, that that reciprocity, one thing I think is really key, each time you are still hinting and sprinkling that referrals exist, it's a part of your business. Um, cause you said, you mentioned it's on the survey that they kind of customize the referral bonuses, right. When, when they're getting that free gift. So is that a key part to any business you work with is you need to kind of spread the seeds of referrals, um, before you even ask for one. Yes. So there are three pillars that need to be in place for consistency and predictability around referrals, as well as to allow it to perpetuate, right? Cause most people are getting like a trickle of that lead channel, but they've never actually turned the faucet all the way on and are getting the full weight of what that channel can provide to your company. 
And so the tactics of it, are, the, these principles I'm going to tell you right now are key. And the things like resetting expectations and engaging reciprocity, all those things will actually amplify the, the overall process. But, you know, even if your experience sucks and your clients hate you, these tactics will still get you referrals. But uh, a great customer experience and, you know, that, that whole journey, being aware of that and surprising and delighting, et cetera, will definitely amplify the results, but is it cool if I draw the board real quick? For the yeah, draw it. And so this? just um, what I'll do is for those that are listening, first, encourage you to go look it on YouTube because one, I mentioned Chad's setup is cool as hell, but you're going to see him drawing what um, looks like a taco. Now, <laughs> uh, we have an arch and line Boom. down below. There's the taco. Yep, yep, there's the taco. So, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be pausing and kind of walking you through um, in moments kind of what he's drawing, but um, we'll, we'll make sure that it works and it's not too clunky. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So what I just drew is what I would call a, a, a referral arc. And so this is like a typical customer journey, right? So this could be anywhere from a 30 day experience all the way up to like a 24 to 36 month customer experience. Um, and along this experience, there are three major points at which we need to be taking specific actions to really make referrals pop. The first one is what I call priming. And for those that are um, listening at home, I'm just going to come in. So priming was the, um, was that priming or priming? You said priming, Priming, right? priming. Yep. So yeah, because yeah, like priming is two M, sorry. Right now, yeah. yeah um, so that's just at the front end of this curve here um, that you see the priming going to that point just for people that are listening at home. Yep. And priming is, just so I can explain it here, priming is the warm up. This is a necessary step. Like I mentioned before, 90% of referral opportunities are lost in the first two weeks of signing a new client. And it's because people are not warming up their clients to the idea of referrals or even like, like getting them to a spot where they're even thinking about people, right? Like they're working with you for them. They're there for a result. They paid you for something that they want. They're not thinking about connecting you with other people that might want that thing right now. Right? So, uh, logically, you would think at the beginning of an experience to talk about referrals would be too early, um, but asking for referrals that that at the very beginning is too early. But talking about it, you need to do. Okay, so this this priming experience would be like essentially the first week, one to two weeks of signing a new client, and what it does is it gets your clients excited about and wanting to refer you from the very beginning. So one of the things, and I'll just show you a couple like little um, tactics that we'll typically use, a couple bolt-ons. So one of the first things is that gift survey that I talked about, right? So a little gift survey engages reciprocity, gets them excited, but it has a couple of quick questions in there, right? Let's take a second to customize your welcome gift, program gifts, and future referral rewards. There's also another question in there that I call a trigger question that says, hey, if we could show you a simple way to earn your entire program investment back for a referral program, how interested would you be in learning more? And it gives them an opportunity to say, oh, super interested or no, not interested. But even the people that are probably never going to refer you will typically say super interested. Tell me more because they just paid a bunch of money. They just paid you money. And this is happening on day one. And so now they're like, oh, I'm interested. I'm, I mean, there might be an opportunity at some point down the road that I decide or somebody asks me and I don't want to miss out on what this looks like. And when they mark that, now they've just passed a level of compliance where they're actually saying, yeah, tell me more. So now they're asking to hear about it versus you just, you know, vomiting it onto them or ambushing them in 60 days or whatever. Which removes a lot of that tension we talked about before, because you don't have to feel like you're reeking of desperation when you ask, please give me referrals, right? It's like, hey, are you interested? And they're they're giving you, um, you know, a, a green light. Now, I imagine there's probably some testing and you guys have really mastered the art of what that language looks like, which is something we won't talk about right now, but... Um, I would imagine that there are some do's and don'ts and, and you and your team probably really specialize in the best ways for that business and where you're asking to make those questions work. Um, but anyway, yeah, I think that's obviously brilliant, super smart. So um, they've been primed through that survey and they've taken action and say, yes, I would like to get my money back if possible sometime maybe into the future. Exactly. So we've primed them where we've warmed them up. There's a whole process for this. So that gift survey is one of many things. We've warmed them up. Now we, the second pillar is what we would call timing. So yeah, timing and then for those home, this timing. is right in the center of the arc that we see right now over this thirty to forty-five day period. Yeah, so this timing period typically is going to come in the first fourteen to forty-five days of a customer experience. I would put there, and what we're looking for in that period is what we would call the euphoric phase or the honeymoon phase of their experience with you. 
this is the point at which your average client starts to experience some level of results, or at least has the thought like, Ooh, this is working. This, this is, was a good investment, right? Because at scale, you know, you've probably heard coaches in the past say, Hey, the best time to ask for a referral is right after they've had a great result, which typically is the case. You, I mean, you want to set it up and you want to prime it first. Cause if you ask right after they had a great result, like, Hey, you just lost 10 pounds. Hey, congrats, you know, Kyle, on losing 10 pounds. Who else do you know that needs to lose 10 pounds? It kind of waters it down a little bit and feels kind of crappy. So if you haven't primed them, it's not, it doesn't really work. Like people say it does. Um, but if you prime them, then the best time is right after they like right when they're in that phase of feeling like they made the right decision. Now at scale, you can't keep track of when every client gets to that phase. So you have to kind of pinpoint, awesome. you know, well, X you amount of days into our process. This is where the average client starts to feel this result. And then that's the point at which you're going to have a process in place to make an actual direct referral request. Um, you know, and real quick, one of the things that we do with our clients in this priming phase is we actually get them to start to already think about people who might be a good fit at some point in the future as they start getting results. So we hard set that reticular activating system, that RAS that Tony Robbins kind of popularized, right? The part of the brain that deals with conscious thought. So we have them at the very beginning, already consciously aware of not only do you have a referral program, not only is it really valuable for me and the person I might refer to you, but I'm already starting to think about some people who might be a good fit at some point in the future. So, so then when we get to this point, it's not even necessarily asking for a referral. It's just almost even reminding them like, Hey, you know, like would now be a great opportunity to introduce the people that we were talking about at the very beginning. Yeah. Which is so key because now it's, I have people in mind that I'm like, you know what? I know we have similar problems, whatever it is, right? We're looking for similar solutions, but I don't want to look dumb. So I'm waiting until I know that it would be a good time to share, but you could totally forget about it. And so it's a great time to remind them, you know, uh, you prime remind um, at, at those inflection points. But no, I think that's really interesting too. One other thing I think is really great about that, that timing phase or the, um, when they're kind of that honeymoon phase and when you're setting those expectations, if people are not in that phase and you're expecting them to be, you also have another another net to say, hey, someone's falling off. They're not getting the experience they want. So um, whether it's a, a supplement or a course or whatever, you know, be able to use the words, you should be experiencing this at this point in time. If you were not, you need to reach out. So you have another um, checkpoint for those, uh, you know, grudge holders or whatever they might be um, that aren't getting the results that they want. So no, super smart there. I like that a lot. So you're, you're actually seeing right into what we do because we actually set up that referral request with most of our clients with what we call a modified net promoter score survey. So we actually will will pre-survey before we make these requests. And there'll be some simple questions like, hey, what are you still struggling with? Or, you know, what do you need the most support with right now? What's been the most valuable piece of this experience or process so far? Right. On a scale of one to 10, how likely would you be to introduce somebody else to us based on your experience so far? And on a scale of one to 10, how happy are you with the overall experience so far? And then based on how they score on that survey, that prompts how we would reach out and make that referral request. So we're actually, we're able to really quickly catch the people who are highly likely to refer us, who are kind of in the middle in that satisfied content category, or who's way down below that we need to actually reach out on and re-engage and kind of give that extra love over deliver and put them into that top category. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. So super, super smart. Cool. Well, so we have, so we have there, what's that last section on the art? Cause I know, I know we're, we're going, we're getting close to the end. So I want to make sure we get that in. All right. You're probably not going to be able to read this cause my handwriting nope. is so <laughs> But we got priming timing. And the third one is reminding. So, so there you go. Reminding. Yep. So how do you keep your clients engaged? and wanting to refer you time and time again, not just once, right? So what another big misconception or another big miss that most companies do is they try and get every client to refer and naturally not every client is going to refer. So uh, we want to focus 80% of our attention and resources on the 10 to 20% that are likely to refer multiple times, right? Not just once, but multiple times. Cause if they can refer you once, they can refer you 10 times if you do it right. So how do we, how do we remind them about your referral program? How do we reset that RAS, you know, on a consistent basis so that even after they leave your ecosystem, you're still on their mind when the time and opportunity presents itself. 
Um, but do it in a way that feels good. It's not like a text that says, hey, don't forget about our referral program, right? Like if you know somebody, send them to us. Those eeky like desperation ones like, ugh, ugh. Yeah, there's, there's those. And then there's all other ones. There's just nothing sticky to it. It's like, okay, cool. Good to know. And then it's out of sight, out of mind. Like, you know, so there's got too easy. It's, it's like, they don't, they don't see it even really, you know, it's there, they see it and they don't see it. Right. So um, there's a whole process to be able to consistently keep them engaged as well. That's cool. So no, that's awesome. So you got to make sure you're not only we got to get you primed so you understand kind of the realm that you're in and you avoid the awkwardness, right? Now I'm starting to think about, okay, if this works out, who would be the people I'd talk to? Um, but then they're also under aware and excited for whatever that referral program would be in the priming phase. Um, and then timing, wait for the right moment, right? Just that it's funny. I know this is a weird example to bring up, but it really makes me think my, my 13 year old is like trying to engage with girls for the first time. And we talk a lot about timing. I was like, don't be the person that forces this. You got to wait for the right time. Uh, but when you have that good emotional moment, right? Make sure you strike while the iron's hot, so to speak. And then finally remind, which the big thing I'm getting out of that remind step is it should be a reminder for the people who have already shown that they're willing to refer and they're going to keep doing it because you're totally right. And I don't know why this makes you think of my insurance days, but when you find a good referral source, they are worth their weight in gold, right? Because if they're willing to refer to you once, twice, three times, um, do everything you can to keep them continuing to do it, especially if they're sending the right people your way. Um, because people that like to refer are going to do it a lot. Um, it's it's important to them. So make sure that you're, you're really focused on them. That's an awesome little, you know, the, the core, what do you call them again? There were like three core pillars, right? Yeah, those are the, those are the core pillars. So priming, timing, reminding the kind of real quick, I know we're coming to an end here, the secret weapon to all of these, there's a the kind of a secret weapon that makes all these work together. And I would call that automation. So we can actually, we can actually automate 90% of this and basically turn it into like this little referral engine that just runs in the background of somebody's business, just basically printing money. Um, and then, you know, these are with our clients, we'll have this all done and built in a week. So they're already put it out there in, on week two. Uh, if it's something that your listeners want to do on their own, then here's the takeaways, right? Priming, tell you, have a referral program and tell your clients about it as soon as they come on board. Um, understand your customer experience and where's that euphoric zone? Where's the first time that your average client starts to get results and make a direct referral request? Nobody should ever come into your ecosystem and leave your ecosystem without at least one direct referral request, right? And then reminding, you know, have an automation, have something put together that is valuable, that makes your clients want to refer you, or at least the ones that are your referral centers has them engaged and continue to refer you. Dude, that is awesome. I, it's, again, this talk is one of those things where I love, I, one of my favorite things when you get one, things based on human behavior because they scale now and forever. And two, there's something that you probably have experienced, you know about, but you're not doing anything to, to really focus on and improve, which this seems to strike both of those boxes, which makes it just a super fun conversation. I think really valuable to any of the listeners. So first, Chad, I just want to say, Thank you so much for your time. I, it was really, really awesome, not just your setup, but even hearing this again and learning new things and, and having new enlightenments from the first time I saw you present on it is just awesome. So you've been excellent. I know the value has been huge, which is the next thing is I'm sure a lot of people are like, hey, Chad mentioned that his team will just do this for my business. And even you know at whatever price point, that sounds amazing. So I could start printing money in my business with a really great scaled referral program. So how can people get a hold of you, whether it's they're not ready to go use the service, but they want some more resources, or if they're ready to sit down on a call with you and find out how you can impact their business? Um, what should be the things that they do? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to give you some in the show notes or on the YouTube, wherever you want to put it. I'm going to give them access. We'll put in the show notes in the descriptions. Yep. Perfect. So it's called the laser targeted leads framework. So it's going to talk very in depth about each of these three pillars and give you some, you know, takeaways for how you can do this right now, whether you work with us or not. So that's available for anybody that stumbles on us uh, from your channel. And then if they do decide to have a conversation with us at any point, really simple process. It's not a hard sell process. We fully guarantee our results with up to a 500% ROI guarantee. So, you know, a lot of our clients, if they don't 5X what they pay us, they can ask for their money back. So it's a, this is a very simple, easy thing to do. I know it seems complex from everything that we talked about today, but we really pride ourselves in taking these complex uh, ideas and psychology and putting them into really simple, implementable bolt-on pieces of somebody's company. 
Uh, but that LTL framework is the first step, right? To jump into that and see if it even resonates with you and your business. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's super, super great. And again, guys, that'll be in the show notes. Um, it'll be, like I said, on the first comment or wherever they put it on YouTube. Somebody does that. I, it's not me, but it'll, it'll be there no matter what. And I would tell you, no matter, all of you need to go and get that, you know, the, obviously the, the, the document that's going to give you all those core pillars and deep description, because th this could be, you know, kind of a make or break difference in your business, depending on where you're going. Even if you're good right now, having something like this is going to sustain you to be good well into the future as things change, especially as I've seen over the last year's businesses that I never thought would disappear, struggling and on life support because something changed in their acquisition strategy. Some traffic channel said no or got too expensive and they didn't have something like referrals in the back end supporting and keeping them going um, until they solve those problems. So sometimes even just having a channel that could provide you time or more resources, resources to acquire, all of it's super value and you need to make um, the effort to, to getting this information, changing your business today. But again, Chad, amazing time. Um, really, really appreciate it. Look forward to you know talking in the future. It looks like you had one more thing to say, and I don't want to. Yeah, I was going to say one more, one more, one, we'll one more thing that I'll throw out to your listeners is on that LTL framework. I'll, I'll make sure that on the back end, there's a way to schedule a quick 15 minute chat with my team to give you even a little bit more customized approach to your business, whether we work together or not. Any questions you have around it schedule that chat and we'll, we'll help you, you know, kind of personalize some things there that you can run away with right now. Great stuff, Chad. Um, so we'll, again, thanks so much for the time, everyone else, please rate, review, subscribe. Also, um, go download that, talk to chat as much as you can. Anytime you see him talking again, make sure to listen because it's always great. Um, and then uh, last thing too, if there's anyone else you want us to be talking about, any other conversations you want to hear us having, please uh, read, you know, leave comments in the blah, blah, I can't talk right now. <laughs> leave those questions in the comments. We are always listening to those. We do pay attention when we have our meetings, when we find our next guest, um, you know, you're directly impacting those. So um, again, thanks so much for the time. Everyone have a great one. Be safe out there. You have a great one too, Chad. Until next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.